So with the sobering reality that um, the eclipse is coming tomorrow, actually for over a week now, it's been on my heart to explore this topic um, that starts in Deuteronomy, um, the blessing of returning to God. This is a time of uh, solemnity when we should be in mourning for our country and repenting and coming back to our God because we have forsaken our God in this land. I never get on Facebook, but my sister, Honey, yes, that's her real name, sent me a message on Messenger. And after I read the message, um, I looked around for a minute on what had been in my feed recently. And there was an American Indian that was wearing a shirt that said, if your ancestors didn't look like these people, then you're an immigrant. And of course, it was a picture of Native Americans. And it grieved my heart because I went back in my mind to the word of Yah, like I always do. And we have in Zephaniah, it says that he will leave in the land a humble people. There is no humility in that statement. This, the United States of America, is a promised land. And indeed, the entire earth belongs to our Father in heaven. We did not create it. We are given the privilege of having stewardship over the land because we are subjects of the king of the land. The king is Yehusha Mashiach because Heavenly Father gave this land to his son. Indeed, within the scriptures, we find out that the son is called the word and nothing was created without the word. So we find out he was even the creator of this world, which makes perfect sense then for why Hasatan, he wants to destroy it. Because he does not want Yusha Mashiach to have an inheritance. His inheritance is this world that he created and the people. The people are his inheritance. And he wants all of it destroyed because he hates the Mashiach, and he wants to take away everything from him. That's his goal. So getting back to my original thought, there is no ownership in the earth. Whether we're talking about the pilgrims that came, or we're talking about the American Indians that were here before them, or indeed those that came before them. Because the American Indians were probably the descendants of the Hopewell people um, that through archaeological um, evidence we know have been here since about um, 600 years before Christ. And yet there were inhabitants that were here before them that were completely different archaeologically and they seem to have disappeared so the american indians were also immigrants at one point and probably israelites because there is a fair amount of evidence um, that they found of carvings of the ten commandments and carvings on rocks that are in paleo hebrew and so on and so forth and also just the feasts festivals that they do seem uh, to have ties to the Israelite festivals, although they've changed and been corrupted because, of course, they lost the truth. And, you know, whatever their history is, they lost the truth. And even to some degree, it would seem, began to worship nature. So the bottom line is, regardless of which group we are, we're all under condemnation right now. We have all strayed from our God. You know, when the pilgrims came, their their whole thing was they were coming to a, a new promised land where they could worship their God, according to what was in their scriptures. 
and according to their conscience. But when they got here, there were tares among them, just like we were told that there were tares sown among the wheat. Every single time there's tares among the wheat. And that is going to continue, as it says in that parable, until um, um, the wheat is fully ripe. And at that point, then the tares are going to be plucked up, bound in bundles and burned. And um, the wheat is going to be gathered into the barn. And at that point, um, the tares are no longer going to be able to trample down the inheritance of the wheat and corrupt them. So that is coming. That separation is right here at our doorstep. What we need to be is the humble people that Zephaniah said would be left in the land or that Isaiah in Isaiah 66 says, um, these are the ones that Yah will look upon, those that um, tremble at my word um, and keep my commandments. Well, someone who trembles at the word of Yah is someone who is humble. So let's go. We're going to read a little bit of Deuteronomy 30, and then I'm going to take you to the Song of Moses um, at the end of Deuteronomy because the song of Moses is exactly what is about to be fulfilled. So I think it's as we as we look forward to this eclipse, which is, I think, the beginning of the winding up scenes, I don't think it ends there because the fall feasts are um, the are the ones that haven't been fulfilled yet. This first one um, is, you know, the Passover. Do we qualify as a people for Yah to pass over our land and leave a blessing behind and not a curse. It's very clear in the scriptures, just look at Isaiah chapter 1, that that qualification is only going to fall upon a remnant, not upon the entire land. And so the judgments instead are going to fall upon this land. Because he's going to take his protection away. And the judgments are going to fall upon this land. And the culmination of the judgments, I'm thinking based on what I saw in the heavens, go all the way through to next spring. So with that sobering thought in mind, let's get into Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse. So the blessing was what happened when they were able to receive the promised land after their 40 years in the wilderness. They went to um, the land of Canaan, their promised land, and the curse. The curse was when they turned their back on Yah. And first the northern kingdom was destroyed and carried away, and then the southern kingdom twice. The southern kingdom twice. Which I have set before you, and you call them to mine among all the nations where um, Yahweh your Elohim drives you. And you return to Yahweh your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today. You and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. That Yahweh, your God, will bring you back from captivity. So this is going to be the gathering. First is the cleansing of this land, the United States, where I believe the gathering is going to happen. Now, when I said this the last time in the last video, there was someone who um, the comment was, you know, I gave up on you a few minutes in when you said that the United States was the new was where the new Jerusalem would be established there. And you gave no scripture references for why that was. Well, if you would go back to my earlier videos Everyone who's followed me for a while knows that this has been a primary theme throughout my videos. Right here, just going back a few videos, Jacob's Land Grant, I go through and show you the scriptural references for why I believe this. If you go back before that, though, 
Um, I have, let me find it, Jacob and the Everlasting Kills, where I go through the scripture references again. Um, if you go back further, then you have Jerusalem and Mount Zion, parts one and two, where I go through um, this reasoning again. I don't know if this one goes through that. Let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh because I don't have time to go back through all my old videos, but I would guess it probably does. And then all the way back here um, towards the beginning of this journey, um, the New Jerusalem part one, I believe, goes through not all of the scriptures because I've learned more as I've gone along, but certainly covers many of them. Um, so if you want to know the scriptural reasons why I'm saying this, please go back and explore these videos because I cover it in depth. So, and I'm going to just go back because I forgot what I was talking about. And you return to Yahweh, your God, and obey his voice according to all that I command you today. You and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. That Yahweh your God will bring you back from captivity. Because the northern kingdom went into captivity first. The southern kingdom went into captivity twice. And have compassion on you. And gather you again from all the nations where Yahweh your Elohim has scattered you. Right. And is going to gather you here. Isaiah 19. To modern day um, code word Egypt. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven from there, Yahweh, your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then Yahweh, your Elohim will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed and you shall possess it. So which your fathers possessed so first the gathering is going to happen here and then, and this is, I've gone over multiple times. This is in Jeremiah where you, uh, chapter three, where you find this reference. And then you're going, they're going to go and retake the land where the old Jerusalem was the land of Canaan and Yahweh, your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. This is the promise in Jeremiah uh, chapter 31 to love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also, Yahweh your God will put all these curses on your enemies. So this is where there is going to be a change, right? This is when our enemies that are in our land are going to be scattered. The, the, the tares are going to be bound in bundles and burned. And the fortunes of his people are going to be reversed. And on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of Yahweh and do all his commandments, which I command you today. Yahweh your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock. It'll be exactly opposite of what we're dealing with today, where when we um, receive our wages, it's like we put it in a bag with holes, right? It's spent before we even get it. Um, the, um, we will no longer have... Um, Oh, gosh, my brain's not working. Infertility clinics everywhere and NICUs for uh, children that are born uh, prematurely because the fruit of our bodies will be blessed. Um, and the increase of our livestock. Our livestock will no longer be suffering from all of the diseases that have come upon us in these last days. I, I used to... Until two years ago, we had a farm and we had cows and we had chickens and um, for a short time we had pigs and um, 
turkeys and oh my goodness uh, goats um and the interesting thing is i was raised on a farm as a child and i will tell you i dealt with far more illnesses among my livestock um as an adult having livestock than i ever did as a child i mean that's not to say that we are the animals would never get sick but it was nothing like it is today and all the hoof issues and oh it was just yeah definitely we have been under condemnation and curses definitely um let's see for yahweh will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of yahweh your elohim to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law of the torah and if you turn to yahweh your god with all your heart and with all your soul this is why we're reading this because this is what that um final eclipse is telling us that we have to turn we have to turn and we're going to read the song of moses next in just a second for this commandment which i command you today is not too mysterious for you nor is it far off so he's going to go through and i'm just going to give you a synopsis of this he's basically going to say we're writing this on a tablet and it's going to be read to you yearly that this is not a big mystery to you um you don't have to go up into the heavens to find out what yah expects of of you and we don't have to either this is once again we are the israel of the latter days and that is why we have the law written that is why we have bibles printed in the millions there is a reason for that because we will not be held blameless a bible is readily available to everyone today see i have set before you and by everyone i mean everyone among the gentile nations which is where we know that ephraim is located go back to my earlier videos i go through um various scriptures in Hosea and in other places to show that that is where um, Ephraim and the ten tribes are located. They are among the Gentiles. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love Yahweh your God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And Yahweh your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. Okay, and remember, and I'm going to take you to the Song of Moses, which is going to bring it to our day. It's going to bring these promises right down to our day. And actually it does here. Because remember, we started this by talking about, let me just go back up there real quick. Who is this addressed to? It says, shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where Yahweh, your God, drives you. This is us. This is us being brought back, calling these things to mind from where we have been driven. This is talking to us right now. Even though it was given back in the day of Moses, this is who it's addressing. Now there's something that I want to look at with this. Hang on. There are three things that he tells us we have to do um, in this verse. I command you today to love Yahweh, your God to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments. Now, we talk all the time about keeping his commandments. The statutes are the hukah, or the hukim, if you're talking about um, multiples of them. And what you find is that this is uh, translated in many different ways. Like here, it's the, the hookah of the Passover. It's the appointed feasts. 
the Hukim are the appointed feast. And even if you go to Jeremiah chapter 31, it tells us that the Hukim of the moon, because it's the moon that tells us when the appointed feasts are to be kept. Um, it tells us that if they are not kept, then um, Israel will cease from being a nation before him forever. So the fact that we are to be aware of and keep the Hukim, the appointed feast, started when Israel was chosen as a nation. Um, uh, and these things were prescribed um, by Moses and will go throughout the millennial reign. I mean, we have at the end of the book of Zechariah, it tells us that those nations which will not come up and worship and gather for the Feast of Tabernacle, that um, they won't have rain and, and other plagues will befall them. And that's addressed specifically to the heathen. So, right. So we have the laws, right? The commandments, the Mishwata. And the Mishwata comes from the word mitzvah. That is when the boys go through their mitzvah in the Jewish way of doing things, they are um, making a vow that they're going to keep the mitzvah, the mitzvotah, the commandments. Okay, so the commandments are the mitzvah and then the appointed feasts or the appointed gatherings or the appointed times, uh, the rem times of remembrance are the hukah or plural hukim and then the other thing that nobody ever talks about and this was um something that i wanted to bring up are the judgments the mishpats the judgments we are told over and over as a matter of fact you know what? i'm just going to take you to this scripture okay this is the very first chapter of the book of isaiah and this is talking about the daughter of zion um specifically um, Ephraim and the ten tribes among the Gentiles. This is our moment. And this is what he has to say about us. A people laden with iniquity, a brood of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken Yahweh. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. So he is at this point where he's done. He's done. He's not going to keep um, striving with the people. He's done. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints from the sole of the foot even to the head. There's no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been, they've not been closed nor bound up or soothed with ointment. That is the situation. Therefore, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. This is what's coming, guys. This is the judgment. And it is at our door. Strangers devour your land in your presence. That's already happening. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. So the daughter of Zion, this is what I told you this is talking about, is left as a booth in a vineyard, as a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Unless Yahweh Sabaot had left to us a very, look at this, very small remnant. We would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. He's leaving a remnant in this land because he's binding up the tares in bundles and he's going to burn them. And this is the barn. The barn is going to be located here. And he's going to gather the wheat into the barn, starting with the remnant. And then this becomes the gathering place and becomes filled with righteousness as the peoples come from the four corners of the earth to fill this land with righteousness. Hear the word of Yahweh, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to um, the law of our God. You people of Gomorrah, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? Okay, and then he comes down and here's where I want to go. So he talks about um, our Sabbaths and our uh, solemn assemblies. He's updated to, to his nostrils with it. Um, anyway, he says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Look at this. Seek justice. And what is this word? 
for justice. Mishpat. Mishpat. So when we talk about this, we talk about keeping his commandments. We talk about keeping his feasts. But we don't talk about the fact that the th third fold thing that we were commanded to do is to be a people of Mishpat, a people of justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Because the curse that's on us right now is going to be reversed. And instead he's going to leave a blessing in this land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured, what? By the sword. Okay? For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. And that is where we are. The land has not qualified for the Passover. Only a remnant has. And they will be hidden in his hand. Let's continue. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice. What is this? Mishpat. Righteous judgments. Treating people with kindness and dignity, taking care of the less fortunate. What does he say is the opposite of of this? He says, but um, it's a, he says righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver, silver is um, the religious leaders, the priesthood has become dross. Your wine mixed with water. Wine is the doctrines. It's become mixed with the doctrines of men. Your princes are rebellious. These are our political leaders and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore, Yahweh says, the Yahweh Sabaot, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my, my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross. Purge away the dross from the religious leaders. Okay. He's going to leave a humble people behind, Zephaniah, and take away all your alloy. I will restore. This takes us to Micah. This is exactly what he says in Micah. Okay, I said Micah, but I meant Malachi, forgive me. Slip of the tongue. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And Yahweh, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Yahweh Sabaot. But who, this is getting to the, the dross that we were talking about, who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's soap, I'm sorry, refiner's fire, I was reading ahead, and like launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of what? Of silver, just like I said, silver are the religious leaders. That is the priesthood. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to Yahweh an offering in righteousness. And remember, when we're talking about judging righteous judgments, it's about taking care of the widow, the fatherless, the poor. And the very next thing in Malachi is, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me. That is the curse instead of the blessing that we were just reading about. Even who? This whole nation. Okay. This entire nation is coming down. And indeed, I would say this extends to all the Gentile nations. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says Yahweh Sabaot. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. So like I said, we talk about keeping the commandments. We talk about keeping the feasts, but we do not talk about keeping righteous judgments. And while we're in Malachi, I just want to bring this up. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes, look at that, and 
judgments, judging righteous judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh. And what is he going to do? Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. We are the children. Turning to our fathers is going back and reading his word and understanding what the covenant was that was made with Israel, that will always be made with Israel, that must be re-entered into. And it has to do with keeping the commandments, the hukim, which are the appointed festivals, and judging righteous judgments. It says, the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Because then there are, if there are no righteous on the earth that can enter into the covenant of Jeremiah 31, then there is nothing to do but destroy the earth. Okay, so we're going to finish Deuteronomy 30 and then we're going to read the song of Moses. So it says, But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today, this was thousands of years ago, that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. And this, this, as I showed you earlier, he's talking to the people that are about to cross over jo Jordan to go in and possess. But this begins talking about the people already in the scattered state among all the nations where they've been driven. So this is talking to both groups at the same time. I call heaven and earth as witness today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love Yahweh, your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. Now for the song of Moshe. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teachings drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Um, as I read the scriptures, I believe that it is like a tapestry and that you have these key phrases and key words that will draw your mind or your attention to another place in prophecy or another place in the scriptures so that we can put the full tapestry together. And so when I heard, let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, then it took me to Joel 2, where it says, be glad then, you children of Zion, Zion, the new Jerusalem, that's going to be established right here in this land in the United States after it's cleansed and rejoice in Yahweh, your God, for he has given you the former rain faithfully and he will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the first month is when we have the Passover, interestingly enough right? The first month of the year, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So we have the former rain, the um, teachings that we just read, um, the, the Torah that was given. And then what is this latter rain? The latter rain makes me think of the other prophecy, which is also right here in Joel 2. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. That is what I think of when I'm thinking of the latter rain. So let's just go back up to, I think it was verse 22 where I started reading. Um, nope, 23. Okay. 
okay, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floors shall be full of wheat, and the vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. Oil, the covenant, wine, the, um, the, the, the Torah, the true teachings of our God. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust. All of these invading armies that have come into the land um, from all different um, directions to destroy us. To, to destroy us financially, to destroy us um, um, politically, to destroy us um, um, religiously. My great army which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of Yahweh your God. You, I'm sorry, who has dealt wondrously with you. This is what we're looking forward to for the remnant. It's going to be amazing. And my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am Yahweh your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahweh. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of Yahweh shall be saved. That's what's required. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as Yahweh has said, among the remnant whom Yahweh calls, the remnant that's going to be left in Mount Zion, where the new Jerusalem is going to be established. That's where deliverance is going to be. And people are going to be gathered from the four corners of the earth to Mount Zion. Let my teaching, I'm back in Deuteronomy 32, let my teaching drop as the rain, my speech distill as the dew, as raindrops on the tender herb and as showers on the grass. The grass are the people. For I proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God. He is the rock. His, so this is, this is reference in the Old Testament to the Mashiach, to the Messiah, to Jesus Christ. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. Okay, there it is. Mishpat. All his ways are Mishpat. If we're going to be like him, then we're not only going to keep his commandments. We're not only going to keep his um, appointed feast, but we are also going to seek justice. Mishpat. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children. That's what we found in Isaiah chapter 1 that I already read to you. Okay, I'm just going to read the tiniest bit of the beginning of that. It's the same language. Um, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Same language. Same people. This is a latter day prophecy about these people who have been taken to this promised land where, because they had a desire to serve God in righteousness and they have his word before them and yet they have turned their back on him. A perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus deal with Yahweh, O foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father who brought you, who bought you? Has he not made you and established you? Who bought us? It was Yehusha Mashiach who bought us, right? Through the great redeeming work that he did. And because he bought it, he's bought us, he's also our father. This whole thing is talking about Jesus Christ, Yehusha Mashiach. Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. I will turn the hearts of the children to the fathers. 
Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the children of Israel. For Yah's portion is his people. The children of Israel are his inheritance. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. I would hope that you guys would go back and look um, at the video, if you haven't seen it, called Jacob's Land Grant. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. There is a separate land grant that is given to Jacob in the scriptures that is inherited by um, Ephraim and Manasseh, by Joseph's children. And therefore, by extension, to the ten tribes of Israel, who are his fellows, his companions. It's an additional land grant. I hope you'll go back and look at that one. Um, so anyway, for Yah's portion is his people, Jacob is the place of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the wasteland a howling wilderness. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wing, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So Yahweh alone led him and there was no foreign God with him. So this happened, but it is happening again. This land, when the gospel is taken from the land, it says that they will not have a famine of um, bread, but of hearing the word of Yahweh. Hang on, I'll read that to you. Amos 8, um, starting in verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Yahweh. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of Yahweh, but shall not find it. I find it interesting that it says they shall wander from sea to sea. Because how is this land described? From sea to shining sea. That is in um, one of the hymns about this land of America or the United States. Okay, it's what became America the Beautiful. The original poem was written in 1893. Oh, beautiful. Oh, sorry. Let me just turn my phone off. Sorry about the interruption. Oh, beautiful for halcyon skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the enameled plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee till souls wax fair as earth and air and music hard at sea. Sorry. I get emotional sometimes when I read these things. Um, oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern impassioned stress a thoroughfare for freedom beat across the wilderness. America, America, God shed his grace on thee, till paths be wrought through wilds of thought by pilgrim foot and knee. Oh, beautiful for glory tell of liberating strife, when once or twice for man's avail, men lavished precious life. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Tell selfish gain, no longer stain the banner of the free. O beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. America, America, God shed his grace on thee. Tell nobler men, keep once again the wider jubilee. Back to Deuteronomy 32, he found him in a desert land and in a wasteland, a howling wilderness. Yes, because we're going to and fro from sea to shining sea and we cannot find the word of Yah anymore. He encircled him. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an, eagle, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so Yahweh alone led him, and there was no foreign god with him. That is what is about to happen. 
Isaiah 40, starting in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? Quote, my way is hidden from Yah, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That is the deliverance that is coming. That's being described right here in Deuteronomy 32. Moving on with the song of Moshe. He made him ride in the heights of the earth that he might eat the produce of the fields. He made him draw honey from the rock. Honey from the rock. Honey from the rock. That is a video that I did a month ago. And oil from the flinty rock. Curds from the cattle and milk of the flock. That's talked about also in Isaiah. So this is part of a prophecy about these last days. Um, I'm in Isaiah 7, 21. It shall be in that day that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he will eat curds. For curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. This is talking about the remnant. Okay, continuing in Deuteronomy 32, and oil from the flinty rock, curds from the cattle, and milk of the flock, with fat of lambs, and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the choice of sweet, and you drank wine, the blood of grapes. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. So this happened will happen again, but now he's returning to an earlier time. So this is this happens constantly in prophecy. You're going to weave back and forth between the very last days, the last gathering when everything is redeemed, to the first gathering when everything went wrong. And there's constant contrast between the two. By the way, Yesherun means... Um, upright or righteous one. It was a term of endearment used to describe um, Israel. But Israel, Yesherun, grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick, you are obese. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. Could there be any question that this is talking in the Old Testament about Yusha Mashiach? about Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful. Because remember, Jesus Christ begot us on the cross and have forgotten the God who fathered you. And when Yahweh saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. And that's exactly what it says in Isaiah 1, um, which is definitely an end time um, prophecy because the things in Isaiah 1 have not been fulfilled. But it says right here in Isaiah 1, um, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Okay. And then he says, why? Because our hands are full of blood. So same thing going on here. I will hide my face from them. Um, I will see what their end will be. For they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faith. 
They have provoked me to jealousy by what is not God. They have moved me to anger by their foolish idols. I mean, we even have a show called American Idol. And the entire nation just sat there glued to their TV sets watching the American Idol, but had no time for their God. But I will provoke them to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move them to anger by a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in my anger and shall burn to the lowest hell. It shall consume the earth with her in increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap disasters on them. I will spin my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger, devoured by pestilence and bitter destruction, the, the locusts, armies. I will also send against them the teeth of beasts with the poison of serpents of the dust. And this poison of serpents, could that also be pharmakia? The sword shall destroy outside. There shall be terror within for the young man and virgin, the nursing child with the man of gray hairs. I would have said I will dash them in pieces. I will make the memory of them to cease from among men. Had I not feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should misunderstand, lest they should say, our hand is high and it is not Yahweh who has done all this. He actually talks about this also in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 10, when he talks about the Assyrian that he's going to bring against his land. This Assyrian is going to boast of himself and, you know, say, um, I have gathered all the earth and there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. But then Yahweh says, shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up. Or as if a staff could lift up as if it were not wood. Therefore, Yahweh, Yahweh Sabaoth, will send leanness among his fat ones. And under his glory, he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. Exact wording we just read in the song of uh, Moshe. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. And it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field. This is talking about the Assyrians' um, thorns and briars, the Assyrians' forest and fruitful field, both soul and body. And they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of the forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. This is the remnant that's left over after the tares are bound in bundles and burned. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, the few trees that even a child could write them, and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, so the Christians, will never again depend on him who defeated them. They're not going to put their trust anymore in what is being called the Assyrian, which is um, that group of people, this this governing force, this, these strong um, trees, as it were, these strong men who have been given strength by the adversary, by um, Satan himself, in order to destroy um, God's people. But Satan can't destroy God's real people. All that's going to happen is the terrors are going to get bound in bundles and burned. But those who truly love Yah are going to be preserved. Anyway, we're going to read that really quickly here. I'm going to go ahead and read a few more verses. We'll never again depend on him who defeated them, but we'll depend on Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, those who have escaped of the house of Jacob, these are Christians, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decree shall overflow, though, with righteousness. This is exactly what we hear in Isaiah 19, that in striking Egypt, he will heal it. For Yahweh, Sabaoth, will make a determined end 
in the midst of the land, in the middle of the land. Same word that's used to talk about the fact that there will be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land, Isaiah 19. Therefore, thus says Yahweh Sabaoth, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. That's why in Isaiah 19, it's described as Egypt. For yet a very little while and the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And Yahweh Sabaoth will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. As his rod was on the sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be destroyed because of what? The anointing oil. And what have we read over and over today? That there will be oil, new wine and oil for the remnant who are left. Um, let's see. Our hand is high, so this is the Assyrian, and it is not Yahweh who has done all this, for they are a nation void of counsel, nor is there any understanding in them. That's also in the book of Isaiah. I believe it's Isaiah 10 that says that they're, um, oh, and also Isaiah 19 that says that, that their counselors are fools. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How could one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and Yahweh had surrendered them? For their rock is not like our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is is of the vine of Sodom. This is talking about those people in the latter days. Isaiah 1 see hear the word of Yahweh you rulers of Sodom give ear to the law of our God you people of Gomorrah that's what these people in the latter days uh, who of which there's only going to be a remnant remaining are being compared to they're being compared to those of Sodom and Gomorrah for their vine is the vine of Sodom it's Yehusha Mashiach is supposed to be our vine and we are supposed to be the branches who abide in that vine but we've given that vine up and instead, we're, we're the branches of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of cobras. That is the wine. But we're supposed to be drinking the pure wine, which is, represents the blood of Yahushua Mashiach. Is this not laid up in store with me, sealed up among my treasures? Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand and the things to come hasten upon them. For Yahweh will judge his people and have compassion on his servants. When he sees that their power is gone and there is no one remaining bond or free, he will say, Where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge, who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering? Let them rise and help you and be your refuge. Now see that I, even I, am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. For I raise my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever, if I wet my glittering sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to my enemies and repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemy. Now, this is really interesting, this next verse, because this is the song of Moshe, and they would have considered the Gentiles to um, be the other people that they're having to fight against. But what does Yah say here in verse 43? Rejoice who? O Gentiles with his people. Why? 
because he knows the end from the beginning. And he knows that Ephraim and the 10 tribes, the, uh, the other nine tribes, are going to be found among the Gentiles. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants. This is that remnant, and render vengeance to his adversaries. He will provide atonement for his land and his people. That is where we are right now. This, this is why we have had these eclipses. This is what it's warning us of. The first ones went through Salem. That is the foundation of faith. That is telling the people who love him that he's about to take this yoke off of their necks. The next one is going through Nineveh. Telling the rest of the people, repent, repent, because all that's going to be left is the faithful remnant. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. I hope this has been a worthwhile study, and um, I pray that we will all turn our hearts to Yah and prepare for the time that is coming that we might be found hidden in his hand. Thank <laughs> you.